Philip Alain. Uh, she is a former professor of classics at Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, professor Alain holds bachelor, master's, and PhD degrees in classical studies and philosophy from the University of Cambridge. Um, she is the author of Science, Antiquity, and its Legacy, and also Medicine and Society in Ptolemaic Egypt. Um, her talk today is titled Boundaries of Change and Development in Ancient Atomistic Theory. And as a true classicist, she's going to have uh, handouts. Instead of, uh, okay, so I'm going to distribute these. So these are separate? Things on your handout, I just put their context because I didn't have time yet to talk about them. 
um, Xenophanes is talking about how land and sea seem to have interchanged themselves in an endless series of destructions and reoccurrences, drawing upon the distance fossils. And Pedicles is talking about the four roots, maybe everything that um, the previous speaker mentioned. And you've got there a sentence from Anaxagoras to follow you, uh, to puzzle you. We can talk about that later. So let me just uh, summarize firstly the key things about the kind of theory. The key things about atoms are that they are solid matter. They have no void in them. So this is why they're permanent. There is no way in which they can be destroyed. They come in a, um, a universe in which they exist is infinite. It has it's infinite in time, it's gone on forever and has no end. It is infinite in extent, it has no boundaries. The other coexistence of the universe you need, apart from atoms, is a void, empty three-dimensional space for atoms to move through. And this is what is infinite in all directions. However, atoms do come in different kinds. They have different shapes, they have different sizes. In early versions of the theory, it may have been possible that they came in sizes big enough to see a particle size, a planet size atom. But in later versions, it was developed by Epicurus, they were always microscopic, they were too small to see. The crucial thing about them is perhaps that they come in different shapes. And although the number of shapes is, while unimaginably vast, it is an infinite, there are an infinite supply number of atoms in each of those shapes. Whatever kind of shape you have, there are a number of atoms within that. And the fact that atoms come in different shapes means that, for instance, some of them might have hooks or rough parts or loops. And when they're moving through the void, because weight guides them down or onto some other trajectory caused by colliding, bouncing off another atom or atoms, they may be involved in a collision in which they don't immediately bounce away, they catch on to that other atom, becoming overtangled over time in a complex of differently shaped atoms. And these different combinations produce the entities that we think of as making up our world. For instance, um, lead, um, one material may be heavier than another because it contains more void in that atomic complex, as there's a void in between the atoms involved. But it may be softer than the other complex because the atoms in it are, are of different shapes and therefore produce complex. They may be smoother so things bounce off them more. When they may be pointy because they have a different effect to keep combining the more with the sense perception. And while the atomic complex itself may be stable for a while, this doesn't mean it holds on to the same atoms it started with. Atomic complexes are constantly being bombarded, bombarded by other atoms moving through the universe, and every atom comes into a complex with a speed and direction of its own. So every atomic complex is a kind of constant low or high grade vibration going on, and some atoms are constantly moving off it and being separated from it, while other atoms come in, and some of them are captured by it and form new parts of it. So it's always continually, it's always being continually regenerated in the atomic complex. At the microscopic level, the atomist universe is an extremely lively place. But because they all contain void, such atomic combinations eventually lose coherence and integrity and dissolve into their constituent parts. Only atoms and the void which allows this change of motion is eternal. Only atoms are never created or destroyed, but only circulate, combine, become disentangled, and move on to possibly join some different conglomeration, creating a world of some extent transient macroscopic phenomena in which we live. Lucretius describes this in the Hanlock Passage 2G, um, but I'll come back to this one later and look at it possibly. So the starting point for atomism, atoms fall into a void, fall into a weight in the history of collisions for other atoms intervals forming part of an atomic entanglement, but always shaken free and moving on. Okay, so that's my very, very fast introduction to the basis of atomic theory. I'm sorry, it's probably which a lot of what you already knew. And I've passed over some of the more fascinating bits of atomic theory, like the nature of time, or what speed we actually move up through the void, and focus on some aspects more relevant to the relationship between change and continuity. Adam this theory answers two needs, the need to explain change variety and the need to explain order and repetition. It's perhaps easier to see how to explain variety. The theory offers perpetual motion, infinite time, and infinite matter. That's a lot of chance to work with. Anything that's possible in this universe will happen, that will happen an infinite number of times. 
However, there are perhaps some constraints on what level of change of variety happened, and there are reasons it didn't particularly chaotic, and it explains the kind of stability we do in that get. For a start, if you look at the passage to in the handout, the curious, um, there's nothing external to the universe in space or in time. Moreover, the totality of things, he says, is always such as it is now, and always will be, since there is nothing into which it changes, and besides the totality, there is nothing which would pass into it and produce a change. But this was no overall change. You can't have infinitely many jigsaws to make out of an infinite number of jigsaw pieces, but you can't change to another game. Secondly, the crucial fact is the atom is unchanging. The pieces available to make your jigsaws can never change themselves. If the atoms weren't unchanging, you wouldn't have change, you'd have chaos, a constant flux of decay and creation without form or limits or consistency. As it is, however, that infinite time and infinite motion has produced some regular repeating arrangements or complexes of atoms, as Lucretius says in passage 2b, 1. So many primary particles have for an infinity of time past being propelled in manifold ways by impacts and by their own weight, have habitually travelled, combined in all possible ways, and tried up everything that their union could create. So it's not surprising that they have also fallen into arrangements and arrived at patterns of motion like those repeatedly enacted by the present. A similar point emerges from 2B2, which I'm not going to read out, but its argument is basically, this is an Epicurean argument, and its argument is that if you don't want atoms to appear in sizes above the microscopic, there must be some limit on the number of different types of shapes they can have. So, as I said, while these are unimaginably numerous, they're not in fact infinite. But that's another kind of constraint on how many types of atomic arrangements are possible within even an infinite universe. In 2C, Lucretius picks out an example of a type of continuity and order visible in the perceptual world, the kind of order he needs to be able to explain through the chance movement of atoms. I'm just going to read out the first of this. Furthermore, since things have a limit placed on their growth and lifespan according to their species, and since what each can and cannot do is decreed through the laws of nature, and nothing changes, but everything is so constant that the varieties of birds displayed from generation to generation on their bodies the markings of their own species, they must naturally also have a body of unalterable matter. And there, you know, it's in particular that he links the fact that one generation of a finch, which is the same as its parents and its descendants, is linked to the fact that the atoms of cells do not change. I should point at this point that when you think about an individual atom, it's has very, it has the qualities itself of being tangible and of having weight and of having size and shape, but it doesn't have anything like colour or taste. Um, it doesn't have, those qualities only emerge in combination with sense organs. So one final step between unchangeable bits of matter in the void and the fact that one finch is very like its parents. I said the atom is universe is eternal, but it includes an infinite number of worlds, each of which has a beginning and has had or will have an ending. Passage to D in your handout is from a work by Cicero, in which a number of characters debate the nature of the gods. In the quoted section is a speech by a representative of the Epicurean Atomists, asserting that extent of atomic worlds happen all the time. That the world is a product of nature, that there is no need for it to be manufactured or created, and that so easy was that process, but one which you call impossible without fine expertise, that nature will make, is making, and has made, infinitely many worlds. But one thing he means not a pocket universe or probably just a single planet, but what we might call something like a solar system, a local arrangement of order, a sun, celestial objects, atmosphere or equivalent, and some kind of earth in which things happen. Whatever happens in these other world systems, we can only see the phenomena of our own. It is vague that the creatures and the other Koreans need to explain. Why is it so stable? Why are all these temporary atomic complexes interacting in such a reliable, repetitive way? How did we get from three falling atoms to a man in the Roman Empire writing poetry about cosmogony? I mean, perhaps the creatures could be a creation of pure chance in an infinite universe. He could simply have popped into being with some extraordinary and lucky coincidence of atomic arrangements and found himself thinking there in the universe. He might have written very different poetry in this case. I'm not quite sure. He would need some kind of writing material and I'm not sure how long he could have lived. So the answer has to be perhaps somewhat more complex and perhaps to take place in a number, larger number of steps. The Epicureans had a more complex account of how 
complexity on the level of us arose, and it depends on the relationship between plasticity, capacity for change, and fixity. Let's look again at passage 2C and also passage 2E, e, and I'll start with 2E. The sense of fact individual things are created from fixed seeds, which is born and emerges into a realm of daylight from a place containing its own matter and primary bodies. And the reason everything cannot come into being as everything is that particular things contain their own separate powers. She just don't refer to guinea pigs, the stone doesn't turn into fur. There is a fixed nature to the kind of things we have. And in 2C, he goes on from the passages I talked about, where he talks about generations first being the same over time, and then says, For if the principles of things could in any way succumb and be altered, it will not also be uncertain what can and cannot arise. Uh, each thing has its power limited, and its deep set boundaries there. Nor for such a long succession of generations and species replicate the nature, habits, lifestyle, and movements of their parents. So the creatures is talking about the limits in relation to what makes a species a species, and how one generation in one species is the same as another. Referring to the laws of nature, each thing has its own capacity or power that lack its faculties, and this can't stand to become a power to be something else. This is a lack of alterability which derives from their unchanging atomic constituencies. Constituents. This metaphor of this limit, this enforcer of continuity, is a deep set boundary stone. But what are these powers not to change, and where do they come from in the universe without any crater or teleological principle? What are the laws of nature? As I've already said, the permanent nature. Just check my page here. The current nature of individual atoms closes down some of the universe's available potential for change. It sets limits. Atoms don't turn into our atoms or lose bits themselves to all those repeated collisions or disintegrate. And furthermore, there are no other things in the universe except atoms. Thirdly, some kinds of atoms will never be able to interact with other atoms, but only be able to interact in particular ways. Some atoms always bounce off each other, they haven't got anything to look onto. This unchangingness of individual atoms both in their permanence and in those different shapes, which never changes, never alters, and never eroded or dissolved, produces a consistency at the macroscopic level. Because where you do have atoms that collaborate well and form com complexes, they go on tending to have that kind of relationship. Individual atoms change in a piece of lead, but it doesn't get infiltrated by bits of copper or fire, because the kind of atoms that form copper or fire don't interact well with the atoms that make up the lead. There's another the right kind of force that attaches atoms from each other, and that piece of lead disintegrates. But another piece of lead will involve the same types of atoms and behave in a similar way. We know how lead behaves. Similarly, when certain atomic complexes do interact with the atoms in our sense organs, the same kinds of atoms held together in the same kind of way produce the same kind of sense perception. Complexes of a large proportion of 40 atoms produce a sharp bit of taste. So the rules or regularities that control and constrain how atoms interact with each other at the macroscopic level imposes boundaries on each complex's particular nature that last until that complex's constituent atoms separate from each other until it ceases to exist, which atomic arrangement is consistent in itself. To go further into this question, let's take a closer look at what the creature says about a particular era of the past in our own world, the origin story for animals and humans. And this is where it gets interesting to talk about the length of up. The basic explanation of how life began is by a really analogical reasoning. It was widely assumed in the Greek world that spontaneous generation did occur and was possible. Whether you got somewhere sufficiently warm and wet, like a pile of dung, you could see worms emerge, or flies, or other small microscopic kinds of matter. So Lucretius points to apparent examples of spontaneous generation like this as evidence that under the right conditions, that is, when other atomic arrangements are in the right way, Atoms can configure themselves into living things, and this is 2G. Now, 2G also gives you an example of the classicist problem in that when you're translating ancient Greek or Latin, you have choices of how to translate it. And it's particularly so when, like Lucretius, you also read an epic poem, which was written not only to be a philosophical tract, but also a work of literature. And so I varied in my translation of Lucretius between a very philosophical one, which tries to get the sense, and a recent poetic edition, which puts it into rhyming couplets. You can see how differently it suddenly reads. 
Note we must admit that animals that sense and feel are made in sensible particles, but this we can appeal. For examples that the line manifests before our eyes, which makes this obvious to us rather than otherwise. They take us by the hand and show that animals arise from things with no sensation at all. For instance, take the birth of living worms from filthy dung piles when the swollen earth festers with unseasonable rains. I'm not quite sure how I feel about the creatures and rhyming couplets. I'm still trying to get used to this translation. This one on the shelf. So we have spontaneous generation to a limited extent. One trick is to explain what happens next, how the individual living atomic arrangements become species. Let us turn to 2F1, in which Lucretius describes how at an early period in the Earth's history, long before now, it had a fertile regenerative power far in excess of current levels, and thus we've got much more spontaneous generation than we do at the moment. It says, at that time, the Earth tried to create many monsters with weird appearance and anatomy. Antogenous of neither one sex nor the other, but somewhere in between. Some footless or handless, many even without mouths, without eyes and blind. Some of them that altogether along their body, and thus disabled from doing anything or going anywhere, from avoiding harm or obtaining anything they needed. These and other such monsters the Earth created, but to no avail since nature prohibited their development. They were unable to reach the goal of maturity, to find sustenance, or to copulate. But we see that creatures need the concurrence of many things in order to be able to produce and spread their progeny. First, there must be food. Second, a way that appropriated seeds in their bodies to flow out, released from their limbs. And third, in order that male and female can have intercourse, they must both have the equipment for indulging in the shared pleasure. And the animal species must become extinct at this time, unable to produce and spread their progeny. Clear sensible matters. <laughs> now, this theory is an adapt adaptation by the atomists. See what I did there. An idea by another early thinker. Again, this is Empedocles again. I've given the Empedocles passage in 2F2. Um, and part of the argument there is that in Empedocles you have a period in the earth where you have things like arms and ox heads and bits of creatures almost randomly wandering around. Uh, it's not quite the same generative period, but love is on the increase and things are being drawn together in his cosmology. But non viable combinations like a cross between an ox and a human don't work um, because they're physiologically impossible. So if you have an ox's teeth and head, you have a human's digestive system, and the two are just not going to be compatible. The animal is not going to function in the way that actually works, and so their existence is short lived to one generation. The creatures extend this kind of argument to animals on their own, but not only can't properly feed themselves, but are prevented from reaching maturity, and because of this, can't reproduce. Such animals become prey for other creatures and eventually go extinct. Um, he summarizes this nature protecting their development. The nature of things, as I said, is a poem often uses a poetic shorthand that refers back to all the pastoral and cosmological poetry. So, here, nature is personified as an act of entity laying down laws. But how the creatures means it is partly describing what does what doesn't happen, what is never observed to happen. These also explain that it doesn't happen because of the basic nature of the atoms involved and the rules for how complexes of different atoms relate to each other. Just as with lead or fire, in changing nature of atoms means that as an atomic complex forms, what is already there narrows down the possibilities for what it is becoming because its atomic constituents can only be their particular size and shape, and therefore they only work with others um, as if compatible. And so you have a kind of innate co-creation of an atomic complex that's determined by its starting constituents and also the conditions of the world around them. This is particularly visible in living objects because they're so complicated. Nature then prohibits combinations that don't work well together in the sense that they naturally, without outside intervention, fail to survive. One example of a creature's arguments is that sensor is impossible because horses and humans don't mature at compatible rates. A hybrid of a goat and human, I told you, atomism is fun, also doesn't work because goats can eat hemlock, which is poisonous to humans. Oh, so you know this is something you love, if you're running around and see my hemlock, I'll eat that, and the human part of you can't go at all. This implies that at a certain level of complexity, or as complexity increases, there's a kind of rigidity and the necessity of form that emerges from what's gone before, and how that thing interacts with its immediate environment. There's a level of development in which 
things can proceed only in one or a few directions in accordance with what the creatures would call its own nature along a route marked out by boundary zones. We can extrapolate this to a broader set of conditions for the appearance of things like animals and humans with their complex and multiple needs, abilities, and parts. If a local world system in this infinite universe is kind of wide open to all possibilities as it starts, those possibilities narrow as it develops. Some atom shapes won't be able to link onto those already there, some work on stable structures. Some complicated complexes, like being living organisms, can only viably form in specific circumstances. Animals are a kind of atomic complex that must need to move. They can only come into existence once there's ground for them to move over, air to breathe, food to eat. They co-create themselves and each other as they go along. The creatures repeatedly refer to predators and prey as striking features of the natural world. You can't have predators without prey. And their founders, their starting ancestors, can only arise from an earth that was in the right kind of arrangement, from suited to the spontaneous generation of animal organisms on a large scale. So a local world system within the void forms an ontological structure into which new complexes must fit themselves. And the more complicated it gets, the less space there is, the less possibility space in the way for such new things to appear. There's perhaps one more factor in the regularity and constancy of our world and ourselves, and this is the last point I'd like to consider. As we said, passage 2b points to spontaneous generation as evidence of the possibility uh, of how atoms can become living assemblages when more from water is added to other materials. Now, to which goes into more detail on the time at which all these spontaneous organisms, some of which fail to survive, appeared. There's a period during which we have entered into a very fertile state Yes. It was at this time, this is a poetic one again, it was at this time that the earth first, first brought forth the kinds of beasts, but then there was no dearth of warmth and moisture in the fields. Where cultures could be found, wounds began to take root and to spring forth from the ground. And when the embryos had reached full term and burst from there, escaping from the watery sack and gasping into the air, then nature channeled the earth's pores and made the open veins flow with the sack akin to milk, as are the labor pains and mother wells with sweet milk because nourishment in the flood is pulled to its hot breaths. Earth gave sustenance to her brood, warmth clothed them in the herds of grasses, offered them a bed, thick and soft, and deeper down to rest the weary head. Okay, so what is happening here is that to which to describe the period in history in this very fertile state in which myriad life forms spontaneously generated out of soil, watered by rains and heated by the sun, in this warm wet earth with such generative power that bits of it turned into functional wounds. The passages of the earth recalibrated themselves to supply nutritious liquid to the center of the earth, um, a parallel of breast milk. Um, Lucretius at times likens the wounds to eggs and both of them to chrysalises. Chrysalises at the time he's writing are also often brought to emerge spontaneously. The laws of atomic behavior, aka nature, direct the milk by a process similar to the ways in which plant roots take up water and nutrients from the earth, in which are embedded, and the process similar to which a breast of a woman suddenly produces milk, um, which becomes reproductive. This bountiful stage in the earth's history came from then when the body of earth dried up a bit. Now, this is an argument that's based basically on Greek and Roman medical conceptions. Um, for the analogical, for the stages of how female life worked. And basically, when you're female and you're warm and wet enough, you are capable of reproducing. And when you dry up after menopause, or you just have to be infertile, you become more like a man. You become mannish. And you're not capable of reproduction anymore, which is you, your, your flesh, you have a lot of pores in your flesh, and you're basically very, you're basically very spongy if you're a Greek woman, as understood by the medical doctors. And this is essentially the conceptions that being applied to the creatures to the earth. Generated capacity is a matter of being arranged to be warm and wet. When you have to warm and wet enough, produce all those monsters, and some of which could survive. As we've already observed in passing, this kind of analogical reasoning is a feature of Greek philosophy, including that of the Epicurean, including that of the Epicureans. And not only analogies dual identity as the sways of metaphor and prove the philosophical concept is one of Lucretius's principal tools. Most famously, when, most famously when he cites dust motes that are just visible in the ray of sunlight as evidence of atoms themselves. I mean, we've all seen this. If you look in any room and the light catches the dust motes in the right way, you can see them hanging in the air. And this is sort of one of the principal ways in which we have said that atoms are things like this. You've seen things that are just enough like atoms that you can 
and most of them is a form of argument for the plausibility. It goes with an equally common Greek assumption that the world or universe operates in a similar fashion on multiple levels of scale. So you reason from a microscopic to a macroscopic and back again. And so this reasoning for the female body, I think, is not just a question of metaphor. Lucretius is saying that it was when the earth was in this state that it was able to produce creatures like these, include right down to the wounds and the equivalent of breast milk. So the implication is that exuberant generation happens whenever the right atomic conditions are paid, whether it's produced by the wet warm earth, when the well nourished woman or animal female. The flip side of that argument may be that generated capacities always or mostly entail the same kind of atomic arrangements, at least in this local world system. That is, it's not just that you need conditions that produce extreme fertility at one stage in your house history, it's that there's only one set of conditions that produce generation at that scale. In Fred Royal's 1956 science fiction novel, The Black Cloud, anyone ever read it? Um, one character says, and I have no idea if this is true, but some people here may do, says that the human and the fly have basically the same knee joint. Now, the reason that this is, that there's only one good way to make a knee joint. You're going to tell me this isn't true, aren't you? Well, I think the creatures may be having some idea. There's only one way to have something that's extremely fertile and needs atomic arrangements. That's what some people say, a warm and wet. If an epicurean atomists do take this parsimonious approach to functional possibilities, this is another constraint on how much things can change with another world system in their ways. So to recap, atoms and cells in their unchanging bodies and limited number of shapes constrain the available plasticity. The provision of radically strange creatures self-assembled during a generated period in a nurse history is now over, so we'll never know if there are more ways to build a material organism than we can see around us. The raw material, this dramatic evolutionary selection, is there anymore. Only some atomic complexes are workable in the first place, and in complexes like living organisms, workable means able to eat, survive, and reproduce in the world around them, as well as cohere through their differentiated internal parts, such as all which must mature at the same rate. And as atoms co create complex material forms, and then a world in which they interact with each other with other such atomic complexes, all these atomic arrangements become too interdependent and codependent on the system and each other to be able to change and go on surviving. Each complex capable of reproduction becomes increasingly isolated in what it can turn into and therefore begins to persist over time. You look again at 2i. When first the Earth produced the animals, that is no sign that she could cobble together hybrid creatures that combine a jumble of odd parts into one whole. Varieties of plants, however, fields of grain, and the rejoicing trees, things that to this day come teeming from the earth, will find still cannot be created of two species intertwined, but everything matures after the manner of its kind, and every weed by nature's settled covenant attains its individual traits. We therefore seem to have moved from a near chaotic atomic universe of constant random motion, infinite in size, and atomic numbers and possibilities through various levels of plasticity, to a local world system in which all, or almost all, available possibilities for existence have been exploited. The world repeats itself generation after generation, codependent on all its constituents' parts, having achieved a kind of ontological fullness. What possibility, what space then, is left for plasticity and change? Um, I can think of a few ones that over time, atomic complexes do alter their relations to each other slowly, for instance, the Earth has dried up, it could, in theory, go through other similar changes. This creates a set of windows to slow change in evolution and eventually cascade perhaps the final dissolutions or destructions that will mean the end of an individual life or a whole local world system on a bigger scale. Similarly, there are small variations of combinations which might work together towards that kind of change. Unlike goats, I can't eat camel, but there's a variety of things I can eat. Perhaps a series of droughts or rains will change my diet, some other aspects of my life, which if it persists long enough and affects enough people will cause larger changes. I should perhaps mention in passing that um, in ancient Athens you could also have the Lamarckian style change. So language eventually came from species using vocalizations, and they could do other things with them, and then you can inherit that learned ability over time. And the Epicureans may have argued for a new kind of society. It's not clear whether their ethics and their system of how you should live 
was meant to reform was civilization. We very simply recommended it as a group of individuals to escape from the hurly burly of contemporary life. We think it was a former reform of civilization, and that was a human capacity to be further changed or developed. And finally, um, I have to mention the atomic swerve, but when I started this, I was determined not to. Um, Epicurus introduced a new element into basic atomic theory. An individual atom could move at random, without a cause, onto a slightly different pathway as it falls through the universal void. This is the atomic swerve. Sometimes, um, nowadays, we like to be in certainty principle, though the difference is perhaps um, more important than the similarities. This on course movement was widely controversial at the time and has caused much puzzlement since as to why it was necessary. An influential answer was that it was somehow intended to preserve an element of free will, which the Epicureans defended as real, despite their apparently deterministic universe. Perhaps it was also intended to preserve an element of chance in the wider, at least the local world system as well. That's it. <laughs> Responding to Aristotle's criticisms of uh, Empedocles. Uh, and Empedocles uh, was inadequate, Aristotle said, because in fact, we don't usually find an ant face optional. And you wouldn't even notice it unless there was some sort of regularity. So that the regularity of the offspring uh, is presupposed by the unusual care. Yeah, I mean, I think all of these are. What do you want to sort of emphasize about the universe? Um, the atomists and later the Epicureans are always kind of outliers because they are it's like accepting most forms of change and motion and what we see around us is real. And they try and come up with a system that explains it, even though it can do some very hard to imagine ways. So as you point out, Aristotle criticized Empedocles and others for not realizing how very ordered, how beautifully ordered, how well this world, this world works. And that's partly why, of course, he, you could argue he had a teleological theory in which everything worked well together for a purpose. And you know, your purpose is to be an adult male rational human being. That was the life to me, by the way, because I'm not male, so I can't be that rational. But everything, um, <laughs> that's the whole. Um, a great joke, but he story. had a slight blind spot here. So, yes, it's, if I was sort of emphasizing the regularity of things, um, and for that reason, criticizing Empedocles, who has, particularly in his cosmogony, uh, and to be fair, Aristotle was acting possibly to more Empedocles than we knew. We only have fragments, Aristotle probably knew more of what his theory actually was. Um, going as, it's, it's not that chaotic. We don't have all these monsters wandering the world. You don't need this kind of chaotic kind of explanation. We just need to recognize that form and function and then goals will create this beautiful world. It's much more harmonious for Aristotle to say this is a teleological world than for Empedocles of Atomists to go around inventing all these wacky theories about um, monsters and earth generating wounds. And you want to, to come back to where you start, it's probably yes, the Epicureans would be responding to Aristotle as they responded to Plato, if not directly, then by trying to show that their system of argument explained everything more better and more elegantly than those two But also that there's a regularity in Cosmos, even under the atomists. Yeah. And that's oh, what yeah. Lucretia seems to be emphasizing. Yes, he does. So they want enough change to say that change in motion is possible. And then it's, it's quite common. They were outliers in that. It was much more, um, you know, the very influential theories which everyone had to cope with were those of Parmenides, the some extent uh, on, of Melissus and of the others. He said, what is there a fundamental reality that's permanent and unchanging? And change is just illusory. Um, essentially and less important, less real than the others. The Epicureans are unusual in that they give an equal role to change, but they're equally anxious to make sure it does explain stability and order. Because otherwise you get that kind of elemental chaos in which you can't define anything because it has no limits, it has no nature, it has no nothing. But they want to show that you don't need teleology um, or things like that to show that order exists. I'm not sure I've answered your question properly, but we can come back to it after this. I'll answer 
No questions? Yeah. So there's something sort of vaguely Darwinian about Lucretius's idea of sort of random you yeah. know, kind of construction of things and then negative selection to throw out the ones that don't work and the ones that do work perpetuate themselves. Yeah. And this is strangely similar. We should give the credit really to Empedocles because he did have that first notion that at least in one generation, and this is the big difference perhaps, you did have things coming into existence, but only the ones that work survive. There was no one wandering around saying you match a pre-existing definition or you should be like this. It's simply that what worked went on to survive and reproduce and pass its traits on, and what didn't didn't. And that is a basic insight which Empedocles and many atomists use. Um, I don't know if Arm was aware of it, I mean, given or if Erasmus was aware yeah, of it. I don't think I don't think in the second edition he even mentions that, which is when he went through his previous sources. He might also have avoided it both because the Atomists did have a reputation for being extreme materialists and denying, you know, the golden any form, so it might not have been politically <laughs> incorrect. <laughs> that would have been a good precedent to mention. Any final questions? Andy. So I, I think I understood, I've never understood this quite a crucial. I, I do understand how in, when you have infinite space, infinite atoms, and infinite time, you can have structures that have that, that appear, right? That, that I understand is a little bit like the, the ape on the iron the typewriter the yeah, time of the time of the time of the time. But what I don't understand on this explanation is how does Lucretius account for the, the impetus to reproduce the same species over and over again. That doesn't seem like uh, the apes hacking out uh, Shakespeare's son on a typewriter, because here there's a regularity that uh, doesn't, it isn't miraculously reproduced with each generation. And they're, not, they're not claiming that, but it just happens to be that human beings give birth to human beings. But that something now comes to be which, is, which has a it can be a bit difficult to visualise, but then quite a lot of molecular biology is sort of difficult to work out, as, you know, to consider how very complicated evolution does work, and all its extreme complexity, and how it would be out of basic things. So Lucretius, and we have to reconstruct it slightly, because it's, it's not for his, you know, crystal clear by the he or the fragments that Lucretius meant. But there are each um, living organism does have ways of reproducing. So there are sort of generated seeds within its bodies that then go out and will reproduce those atomic arrangements and motions in the next generation, the traits which are available passing on. Of course, even on pure chance, you would eventually get both organisms that assemble themselves into a particular shape and assemble themselves into a shape that would be capable of passing that on. And then I guess negative selection would again apply if you were capable of passing your characteristics on, that would go on happening. I think what I'm sometimes not so clear on, I thought of it when suggesting that the creatures might himself have self-assembled in the void somewhere, do you think? <coughs> like the Hitchhiker's Guide to um, the Galaxy Sperm World, if anyone right. anyone remembers that. Um, is that, is he thinking of living organisms? Is that possible even? Or is there something about the way that an organism is built up with atomic complexes that means it has to happen in steps? Can you only get to, a, say, a functioning brain, soul, psyche? if you have other parts coming first. And that's what I was trying to get up, perhaps with the notion that when atoms bring together, at a certain point of complexity, there are very few groups for them to go that lead anywhere. And so the ones that go down those and produce living organisms were ones that persist. But they are continuously, I mean, they, I think part of the trouble is, I'll shut up in a moment, we're thinking of things very discreet, but what you're actually standing in the atomic universe is an absolute sea of atoms falling over and coming in at you all the same. And you twist all about emotions, not just arrangements. So you're thinking of a very dynamic universe, almost something like a fluid, even though it's discrete parts, um, which is constantly in dynamic with all the other parts of it. And what comes out of those are some very complicated systems that are perhaps not best not seen in isolation, but the scene is filling the kind of ecological niche against all the other things in their immediate and wider environment and world. And that's why I think as things get more complicated, their chances of changing get narrower and narrower as your world system develops into the kind of complexity we see around us. And that takes us back to the point about regularity. By the time we got to the school world, you know, they thought they'd involve civilization, that history basically comes to an end, we were kind of, you know, as good as it was going to get in the first century BCE. 
everything that could have happened, locally at least, had already to some extent happened. There was not much chance for anything to really change. Thank you very much.